Hey guys, welcome or welcome back. Tisha here, back for another Queen Charlotte a Bridgerton review. Go ahead and do me a favor and hit the like button as we jump into this. So it's coronation day. Pamphlets are being folded. Flowers are being assembled. Decor is being laid. We see Brimsley, who seems like he's in a hurry. He's walking down a flight of stairs in an area where he wouldn't normally be. And he happens to run into Reynolds, who claims he is in this area as well on an errand. Neither one of these men should be in this area. Neither one of them are supposed to be there. So they're both kind of questioning each other. But in Brimsley's mind, he's there because he's looking for the king because the queen is looking for him. And he knows that as his kingsman, wherever Reynolds is, that the king should be nearby. Now we left off the last ap episode with Charlotte overhearing George say that he was just performing his duty. So at this point, the two of them still aren't speaking, but the show must go on. And as a result of this, they're gonna make sure that for Coronation Day, they appear happy and united. They have little exchange. Brimsley asks Reynolds if he's taking on another rider. Now, I'm assuming that by that statement, he's asking him if he has another lover or something because it's the way that he said it that was like, why are you asking him if he's taking on a, another rider? What do you mean? Tell me what y'all think. But it's because he's in an area where he shouldn't be. And he tells him, I'm simply downstairs. Go attend your queen. Coronation day is a great day for her and her country. Now, I didn't realize the significance of what happens next until later. But the door opens and the music shifts. It's tense as it's playing in the background. And Brimsley sees something that he's not supposed to see. He says, is that a physician? Why is he being examined by a strange doctor in the cellar? Why is he not being examined by the royal physician? Now, rather than answering that question, Reynolds tells Brimsley, you see nothing. As he's saying this, I'm like, okay, George collapsed the last episode and now he's seeing a doctor that's not a royal doctor. So y'all are hiding something, but what is it? He tells, he tells Brimsley, you have seen nothing. And Brimsley looks at him. He looks at Brimsley. There's an exchange there with eyes. Brimsley leaves. We then see Violet who at this time is a young child. I do not know how old she is, but she's young, okay? She's still in school and doing things like that. She's excited about Coronation Day, despite her mother calling it a farce and saying that they had to go all across the world to find someone who would be willing to marry the king. Now, I'm, I don't know if this is her maid that she's talking to or her governess or whatever, but the governess tells her like, don't repeat the things that your mom says. But as she says this, I'm like, okay, so even the town knew that something wasn't right about the king because why would her mom say such a thing? Why would they be discussing this unless there were certain rumors around? She says that her mother says, because of this marriage, they now live in what she's calling an unnatural society. And I hear this and I know exactly what she means by this. Her mother would have an absolute fit if she saw the Lady Bridgerton that we later see down the road who is talking to uh, the brother of her best friend because Lady Bridgerton clearly now is into chocolate and her mother clearly isn't. So we meet her mother who is going on and on about this marriage situation and how despite seeing the queen, it is not her place to question palace decisions, but she'll serve at her court. She is the queen. That makes her special, but the rest of them socializing among the town the men can can't go uh no she said the men can go to whites now like regular gentlemen i know they have money but money doesn't make them us and i said oh, okay so basically her mother's a racist because 
you're sitting here and you're talking about them and us and how it's not right and we'll accept her because she's the queen, but forget the rest of them. There's a lot of racial undertones in that statement, which makes me instantly not a fan of Violet's mother. But I appreciate Violet's position on the matter, even as a young child, because Violet does not agree. She says, Daddy, the king gave them titles, did he not? He says, yes, beauty. She says, in land? He says, yes, brains, why do you ask? She says, well, mother said they were not us, but the king gave our family a title and land. All the families of the town got their titles and land from the king. That is not the same according to the mom, but it is. And mother, they are gentlemen. Daddy always defines a gentleman as a well-educated man of good family. Lord Danbury attended Eton, Eton with King's father and Lord Smith Smith and Lord Cummings were at Harrow and they all attended Oxford with daddy. She's right, according to her father. They did. Violet says, so they are exactly like us. Better in some cases, considering several of them are from royal families of their own and have more money than we do. Her mother is irritated by the fact that she is speaking truth and tells her to stop talking. But Violet is right. Her mother is sitting there acting like brown people don't deserve to have a title or be given certain things because of the color of their skin. Yet some of those brown people in the town were more deserving of the titles at the time than even she was. And that's what Violet is sitting here saying. Her mother ends up walking off and her father smiles at Violet while while winking at her. And then we hear our favorite narrator. Dearest gentle reader, children are the cherished hope of every marriage, but for a royal in need of an heir, children are more than hope. They are a necessity. We're flashed to present day where the queen is telling her staff to put more colors on the Christmas tree, meaning it's Christmas time. And we find out that this tree decorating situation, this holiday celebration is something that was created by the queen. Now, I don't know if it was the holiday or if it was the tree trimming, but either way, it's something that had to do with the queen. Her daughters are over there laughing and giggling while they decorate a dollhouse. And the queen can't get over the fact that these much older women are laughing and giggling about a dollhouse while there's more important matters at hand. She tells them, you are old. Your wombs are likely dry and useless. Spinsters, I shall leave you be, but you could try. Look at me. I am absolutely gorgeous. Style yourselves. <laughs> the way the queen belittles the kids, if this were anybody else, I'd be like, she's harsh, she's rude, she's not a good mom, all these other things. But there's a way that she does it that's so humorous that I can't help but laugh at what she's saying. But what she's saying is cruel. And Lady Whistledown further lets us know that. So Lady Whistledown comes in. Most of the daughters of our own Queen Charlotte and King George are long on the shelf, gathering dust. So many spinsters, so little time. Surely in this season of giving, Her Majesty must be feeling the sting of being a have-not. I said, Lady Whistledown is a trip because you're you're pointing out that her kids her her wife the, the the ladies don't have a husband and she doesn't have any grandkids at least not ones that she can have as an heir back to the past lady danbury is on her way to have tea with the dowager princess we know because of her demands she now has to fulfill some duties of her own she's reporting over to tea with the princess that the coronation has only drawn Charlotte and George closer. We see the crowns being blessed and the members of the church chanting, God save the king and God save the queen. And we see the king and the queen smile and we see a kiss and a wave. And they're looking like a young couple that is very much in love, okay? At least that's what they present in public. But once they're out of the public eye and they're back at home and their crowns are removed from their head, 
heads. Things are different. Things are not what they seem to the point where we see them go off in different directions immediately. Lady Danbury is there to visit the queen. This is later on. On a walk with Lady Danbury, Charlotte is complaining that George is a lying liar who lies. <laughs> I was like, a lying liar who lies. Okay, we get it. He's a liar. She's mad still because of what she overheard. And rather than talking to him about it, she's just festering in on it. While I think he's trying to protect her from discovering who he really is. So she's reminded by Lady Danbury that her job at this point is to get pregnant. If she doesn't do anything else, she needs to make sure that she's creating a royal baby. Um, the queen tells Lady Danbury, like, look, you don't have to worry about that. I'm fulfilling my duties, even if I hate it. And Lady Danbury is like, yeah, I understand. I know it, you know, it can be a duty at times, but this is just what you got to do. But Lady Danbury doesn't really understand it because unlike Lady Danbury, Charlotte does not hate trying to conceive with her husband. She does not hate trying to make sure that her womb is with child because she is having a great time enjoying the the benefits of angry sex from the looks of what we see we see them snapping at each other in one moment out when everybody else is around but the second that the door closes once she's in his chambers they can't keep their hands off each other they keep saying that this is because they need to do their duty but the both of them are enjoying it to the point where dresses are being ripped off and buttons are being popped and there's kissing and there's moaning she says she hates his ridiculous face and his voice and the way he breathes but i can't tell by the way that they act with each other we then see them at dinner. Charlotte asks George if he could stop breathing so loud. And he's like, well, can you stop talking? They go back and forth about it. And she wants him to leave and stop breathing. So he gets up rather dramatically as she stands up at the same time. He walks over to her and they're like this. And he is breathing all hard in her face, she and his. And he leans in to kiss her while holding her right here. And he holds her chin and says, shall I leave? And she says, yes. And he, she pulls away. He starts to walk off. And as he's walking off, she's behind him and she grabs his arm right here to get his attention. And he turns around and looks at her. And the next thing you know, these two are making out passionately. Keep in mind, whenever they eat, he's at one end of the table, she's at another, and there's a full staff standing around at attention while they eat. So you two just went from arguing to snapping at each other about the way you're breathing, and now you're making out in the room. As they're kissing, he stops and he says, you know it's an even day. He then spins her around so that he's behind her. She's sitting there tossing stuff off the table. She can't get the stuff off the table fast enough. They're practically about to have intercourse right in front of the entire staff as he's talking about this even day because they agreed that they would have sex on even days. Next thing you know, plates are literally crashing to the floor and food is being knocked down as the staff is being ushered out by Reynolds and Brimsley. They can't get them out there fast enough. There is an obvious attraction with those two. So outside the door, Reynolds and Brimsley are standing there talking about how it's been a hot day. And he says, might I be allowed to cool down because of how hot it's been? And they share a smile because we know that the two of them are about to be doing the same exact thing that the king and queen are doing. So they're standing out the door while you loudly hear them having sex. And the Kingsmen later join. Later on, uh, like a couple, I don't know, maybe a minute later, the king is in the bathtub and while he's bathing, Charlotte flings open the door, walks in and says, it's an even day. So she's starting to unbutton her gown because she wants to have sex with him in the tub. And he looks at her and is like, just get in. So she climbs on top of him with her, all of her clothes on 
And I feel like I'm sitting here watching a mini porn because they start kissing and he's touching her breasts and he's squeezing and grabbing her back and touching her neck. And at some point, his hands are grasped around their neck and they're both enjoying one another. Like I said, they can't keep their hands off of each other. It's a whole bunch of different sex scenes in this episode. It's another day. And Charlotte has finally been given permission from Brimsley to attend the things and do the things that she's been wanting to do because the honeymoon period is over. But she finds out from Brimsley, although, you know, there are things you may want to do, that the king doesn't like to do certain things. So she can, you know, find a charity that she likes and attend an opera if she wants to meet with her ladies in waiting, but her husband will not be attending those things. And Charlotte is a smart girl girl because she doesn't understand why the king who seems to be okay isn't willing to socialize she wants to know has it always been this way and Brimsley's like no it hasn't always been that way but it's kind of been a more recent thing so she says okay his social graces are intact he has a nice smile he is tall and strong and handsome and he smells like a man Brimsley then says it might have something to do with the doctor and he realizes that he may have put his foot in his mouth as soon as he says it because she's like, a doctor? What doctor? He says, I could be incorrect. In fact, I misspoke. And she tells everybody to leave us. Everybody, of course, but Brimsley. And she says, Brimsley, what doctor? We then see him and Reynolds sleeping together and Reynolds jumps up out of the bed and is putting on his clothes because Brimsley lets him know that he made it, let it slip about the king being with the doctor. And he wants to know how ill George is and Brimsley tells him there is nothing wrong. There's nothing ill about him. We then see Charlotte and George in another room. They're having sex. And right after they're done having sex, she says, <laughs> are you not well? He's like, what do you mean am I not well? Was that not up to your standards? Like, did I not do what I'm supposed to do? And she said, you saw a doctor the other day in the cellar. It was coronation day. The crown must be examined on coronation day, he says. She says, hmm, what is it? You would think that they'd want to examine the queen as well. It is all anyone cares about, me making a baby. You think there'd be doctors all over me. Instead, you were the one seeing doctors in the cellar. Seems important that you were in the cellar. The cellar feels like a secret. And he says the cellar is where the examination room is. And she's like, fine, because she doesn't buy it. She's not dumb. She said, if that's what you say, then that's what I must believe. So I'm off to bed. I have a busy day tomorrow. I'm to meet my ladies in waiting. After all, I am now, what were those words? Ah, living for the happiness or misery of a great nation. Which lets him know she heard a portion of what was said to his mom. But I wish she would have talked to him about it because it seems like y'all are having all of these issues. He's going off of the way you're acting and you're upset. And rather than addressing it, you're just going to be passive aggressive about the situation. Enjoy certain things, but not deal with the situation at hand. So we later see later Danbury and the princess having tea yet again. She lets it slip that there's a lot of pressure on this being a success and there needs to be a royal baby. Lady Danbury knows that the pressure, the pressure is coming from Lord Butte and the House of Lords. She says, a baby will seal the success of the great experiment. And Lady Danbury sees that as an opening, suggesting that she should host the first ball of the season. And the princess quickly shuts that down. But Lady Danbury points out that if she can't have the ball, then there's no reason for them to continue to meet with each other. And Princess uh, Augusta is like, okay, look, I'll take it up with Lord Butte and we'll go from there. So Lady Danbury, being who she is, is constantly thinking about her next move. She's always on a chessboard. The Dowager Princess is enjoying these talks with Lady Danbury. So she's not trying to mess it up. 
We're back at the Danbury's house where Agatha is being forced to have not so satisfying relations with her husband again, but it's different this time because he isn't happy and he feels a little defeated like the ball will never happen at their home. He says, they dangle joy in front of me and never let me grasp it. And Lady Danbury seems like she feels bad for him and she tells him that he is just as good as they are. I think this is the first and maybe only time that I see what looks like that she cares about him but I don't think she cares about him often but we'll get into it. So she finishes up with him, goes to get her bath and while with having her bath with Coral, she tells Coral that she's going to try to get ahead of this situation, that she has to make sure that she sends out invitations to the various members of the town before the princess decides whether or not she's going to agree to her having the ball. So we go from that to an encounter with Lady Danbury and Lady Bridgerton in present day. They are at a church where Lady Bridgerton is somber because today would have been Edmund's birthday. And she's sitting there talking about, you know, how much she misses him and how, you know, on this day, normally she would have made him a paper hat. It, when she was a little girl, her father used to make elaborate, you know, birthday hats. And she kind of took on this thing and started doing it for Edmund because he had never had it done for him. And she continues and Violet is like, she doesn't like this day anymore. And Lady Danbury says, you may not like this day, but you're fortunate. And as anybody else who's sitting here grieving the loss of their loved one, you don't want to hear, you don't, you may not like the day, but you're lucky, especially not when you're grieving. Now she goes into it more, but it bothers Lady Danbury, not Lady Danbury, um, Lady Bridgerton. And she doesn't have a chance to address it with Lady Danbury because after she says that, she quickly walks away before they can discuss it. We then flash back again and we're in the past where Violet's mother is upset because the Danbury's are throwing the first ball of the season. She's looking at the invitation and she's pissed because she feels like it's bad enough that she has to see Lady Danbury at court. Now she's supposed to go to a ball. She doesn't want to. So it's another day and the queen is hanging out with the ladies and waiting. Various selections are being played on the piano by a child uh, by the name of Mozart. Now, these ladies feel like the queen has no taste and they're whispering it. But Lady Danbury lets them know that the queen has an excellent musical ear. And because she calls them out on it, they agree. Most of the ladies in waiting don't even want to be there. It's a formality. And that's when... Lady Ledger, Violet's mom, informs Lady Danbury that she received an invitation to her, I quote, little ball, but she can't go. As a matter of fact, they were all flattered to get invitations, but none of them can come. What a shame. The racism is real with some of these ladies. The undertones are there and I get irritated by it, but it doesn't last long because I see this for what it is. So, Sorry, I'm trying to get comfortable. My back has been bothering me all day. Okay. Um, where am I? Okay, so Lord Butte meets up with the princess. And Lord Butte says, uh, you know, the town is not going to attend this ball. With wives all over London yelling at their husbands, Lord Ledger's wife is leading the charge. Parliament is in an uproar. Happy wife, happy life, unhappy wife. I have lords whining all around me, drinking. No one wants to go home. Government is grinding to a halt. Perhaps Lady Danbury can withdraw invitations. And the princess is like, I cannot ask her to do that. She will not like it. And he says, it sounds like Lady Danbury has the upper hand, which she does. The dower princess says, no, of course not. I just feel I cannot be seen to choose sides. Now, for the sake of the great experiment, the palace must remain steady in its quest to unite society. He says, if Lady Danbury throws a ball, and this side does not attend, the palace will lose all moral authority and the great experiment will be in ruins. That's what um I said he says. That's what the princess says. And he says, disaster. She says, there will be no disaster. He says, good, you'll have Lady Danbury count, count, cancel the ball. 
right? Which if it gets count canceled, sorry, I always say that wrong. There's going to be problems. So Lady Danbury goes to the queen because she knows how important this situation is. She says, I know you're not going to attend the ball because the king doesn't accept social engagements. Charlotte says, is it, is it not odd? Why doesn't he accept them? And Charlotte is staring out the window, watching her sexy husband, trying to figure out what's wrong with him because he's gardening with his own hands. And Lady, Lady Danbury is listening to her go on and on about it for a bit, but she got her own situation that she's trying to rectify, that she's trying to make sure is fixed before they're in ruin. And as she's going on and on, she can't take it anymore because Charlotte seems oblivious to what is going on around her. She's so focused on her her husband that she's not seeing what's happening here so lady danbury stops mincing words and she just comes out and says that she says do you not understand you are the first of your kind that opened doors so we are new do you not see us what you are meant to do for us I tell you to consummate. I tell you to become with child. I tell you to endure for a reason. You are so preoccupied with whether a man likes you. You're not some simpering girl. You are our queen. Your focus should be to your country, your people, our side. Why do you not understand that you hold our fates in your hands? Your palace walls are too high, your majesty. And she sighs and she bows and she walks out. Because for the first time, she's been brutally honest with her, which is like, look, we've never had these positions before. We're in an experimental phase where we may not have this. And if it's not successful, they'll definitely take it from us. We need you and we need your help basically what she's saying. And I said, okay, Charlotte really didn't get it until she said this. She did not get it. So that night, Charlotte is looking at herself in the mirror and she presses her hand against her stomach as she looks at herself. You know how you would if there was a child there imagining what it would be like. And she quickly turns away from the mirror and heads to her husband's chamber because it is an even day. The Kingsmen stand outside the door and gently touch hands with each other. As I see them do it, the way it's done, because they're on either side, so their hands are like this, and they easily go like this, will take their time, and then you see them do like this with their gloves, and they're touching. I want to know more about their love story, how it came to be, because those two men are so great in showing their love with just their eyes and simple touches that I would love to see how they got to this point. I hope that they expand upon this more. So Charlotte and George have sex. And when they're finished, he tells her he'll see her tomorrow because she's sitting up getting ready to leave as she would normally do. But she decides to lay back down. She says, you live for happiness and the misery of a great nation. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to go there again. Charlotte, I don't want to go there. And she's like, no, no. You live for the happiness and the misery of a great nation. I understand. That must be exhausting and lonely. You must feel caged. No wonder you spend so much time in the garden. He says, in the garden, I am a regular man. I am Farmer George. Do not feel sorry for me. I do not know anything else. I've always been this an exhibit instead of a person. And when he said it, I was like, oh my goodness. I couldn't imagine always having to be on display. I look at um, PKs, like pastor's kids and things of that nature and how they must feel always being looked at, always being watched, always having people paying attention to what they do. They're under a microscope and that's what this is on a bigger scale for the king, for the president, for state officials. They're under a microscope. Everything that they do is watch. She says, you are a person to me. You can be a person with me. Meaning you don't have to be an exhibit. You can be your truest version of yourself with me. And they kiss. She says, no more even days and odd days. We shall just have days. George, I know you do not know me anything, don't owe me anything after how I've behaved. And I know you do not like social events. 
but I need us to do something. He says, what do you need? And she says what Lady Danbury tells her, which is our palace walls are too high. So now we are at the Danbury's. Lady Danbury looks beautiful. One thing about both Lady Danbury's old and new, they're beautiful. But that young Lady Danbury, her eyes just are so captivating to me and they draw you in. So Lady Danbury looks gorgeous and so does her ball. She's convinced that no one would come. Well, no, not her. The Lord Danbury is convinced that no one will come. Lady Danbury isn't sure, but she has hopes that there will be people. The doors open and the first people to be announced are Lord and Lady Ledger as they walk in. Lord Ledger tells Lady Danbury that she couldn't miss it, the wife, because they got a personal note from the king and that no one in their right mind would miss an event that the king was attending. How could she miss an event that the king was planning to attend? Lady Danbury is chuckling. He says her head would burst into flames. This is the social event of the season. Well done, Lady Big Danbury. He tells her, I like you. Let us be friends. Lord Danbury, when can I get you on one of my hunts? Meaning, I'm accepting you. Here, if nobody else does, I'm inviting you on the very thing that you want, which excites the both of them. So the princess arrives, all is well. The party has music, people are dancing, but Lady Danbury isn't liking what she's seeing because there's very much so people being segregated at this ball because the people who already had titles are on one side and the newly found brown ones are on another. She's like, they're not mingling. And as she says that, you then hear the announcement that his majesty and the queen have arrived. The king thinks, the, th the king walks up to Lady Danbury and Lord Danbury and thanks the Danburys for having them. He then takes to the dance floor with his queen as the classical version of If I Ain't Got You Plays. Lord Ledger excuses himself from his wife and asks Lady Danbury if he might, uh, Lord Danbury, if it's okay for him to have a dance with Lady Danbury. He says, yes, he's excited. Violet's dad was bold and I like him. So everybody is watching and people are mingling and the king notices this and he smiles because now people from both sides are dancing with one another and the party is a success. And as he's smiling, his mother, the princess, says, he's so happy. I've never seen him like this. Charlotte then says to her husband as they're dancing, thank you. And he says, you never have to thank me. We are a team, are we not? Overall, the ball is a success. And the Danbury say goodbye to their last guest. And now, because... He's happy. He wants to go celebrate with his wife, which means more uncomfortable sex for Lady Danbury. So we're back at Buckingham Palace and George is admiring his wife. I do not know if you understand what you've done, he says. With one evening, one party, we have created more change, step forward more than Britain has in the last century, more than I ever had dreamed. She says, you can do anything, George. He says, with you by my side, I think I can. They laugh. He says, I can. She needs a dressing gown. She says, I'm in my bedchamber. He says, you need a dressing gown. But first, we're going to find something to eat. Then we're going to go back to my bedchamber. And you cannot be naked to do that. And they laugh. And you see him pick her up and lift him over her shoulder as they, you know, run out the door. And he says, "Be." I, she's like, be careful, George. He's like, I will not let you fall. And you can see the love between them. And the staff smiles and they're enjoying what they're seeing here because they're seeing their king and queen fall in love with each other. So back to the Danbury's. They're in the middle of having sex. He's hitting her from behind. It's all types of squeaking, bed shaking, headboard going. And all of a sudden, squeaking in the headboard stops. And she says, my Lord, are you finished? And there's nothing, no sound, no nothing, no collapse onto the bed, nada. She then turns around, looks behind her and on the floor is her dead husband. <laughs> he, 
<laughs> he went out with a bang. <laughs> So Lady Danbury comes out of the room. Coral's ready to run her a bath because this is what they do. And she looks at Coral and she's smiling because for the first time in however many years she is at this point, she realizes she's free. So she tells Coral he's gone. And she's like, what do you want to do? Do you want to do this? And she's like, I think I need to make sure that we do that afterwards. Let's go ahead, you know, I'm going to go back in the room. We're going to do this and we're going to do that. So they basically, you know, are ready to play the part of a morning family, morning household. So she goes back in the room. You hear a scream. Uh, you hear yelling. My love is gone. My love is gone. The staff comes running up. She's like, please wait. Let me make sure that my lady is decent. So Coral and them were ready for this. And I can't help but notice that the women were prepared. And I feel like the women were happy he was gone. Maybe because they saw the way that he treated, you know, them. We flash to the present. Okay. Agatha has invited her friend Violet for tea. Violet is still upset to the point where she made all types of excuses for over a week not to talk to Lady Danbury. And Lady Danbury then explains herself. She says, when you saw me, I was with the Archbishop discussing funding a school for orphan girls in the name of Lord Danbury. Lord Danbury disdained orphans. He thought education and educating uh, the poor was a waste. And he found girls to only be useful for breeding. You then hear the music change and it gets sad. And she says, you loved. And in your loving, you go to church to seek solace and connection. In you, Edmund lives on. I loathed. And in my loathing, I fund a school to seek revenge and satisfaction. In me, Herman rots. Your heart is full. Mine starves. So when I called you fortunate is because you are fortunate. And it just goes to show you how hard a lot of Lady Danbury's life was and why now in recent seasons, in recent years, we see her doing things as she wants to do them. So if she wants to throw a gambling party with the ladies where they're drinking, she's going to do it. If she wants to smoke, she's going to do that too because she's finally free. So we see the queen and she is alone and she's looking out the window. And this conversation that they had kind of got me. So Brimley says, you know, um, uh, oh, she asks him, why do you think that my girl's never married? And Brimley's like, I don't, I don't know your majesty. I, I don't know. She tells him, try to, he says, I can't begin to, um, but I, I can't imagine why they're not married. And he hesitates. He's like, they're beautiful wonderful, kind, charitable, pleasing young women. And she's like, Brumsley, stop trying to flatter me here by talking about my, my kids. It makes me dislike you more. Answer the question. Why have my girls never married? And he says, your daughters, they are good girls. They love you and the king. And he goes, it, it happened so early. You, you were so young. You, you were so young. If he had died, maybe you would have been hurt, grieved, but eventually you would have healed and moved on. Instead, and he pauses and she says, what? Spit it out, Brimsley. Do not become sentimental now. He says, you are still his queen, forever frozen, forever waiting. Your daughters could not leave you here trapped in time and when he said it i was like my goodness the queen's eyes are watering and she orders him to stand away from her stop talking look away and as she said this i never thought about it but she is trapped her life is lonely because she literally lives in moments of times where she gets to see a glimpse of what was but we'll get to it so this last scene is next level.
in my opinion. The acting was amazing and the dialogue was amazing and the music was perfect and the actors' expressions were spot on. We are back in the past at Buckingham House. Charlotte wakes up in the middle of the night. She's alone in bed. She finds George making all types of sounds and scribbling on a wall, talking to himself. He then takes off and runs through the halls to the garden. Brimsley, I believe, sees him and she says, George is working. Go back to your post. We're fine. At this point, Brimsley is running. He runs into Reynolds and says, what is it? What's going on? Just stand guard at the garden door. Clear the back hall. He tells him, lock the servants in if you must, but keep everyone away. Please, Brimsley. And he says, all right. The king is yelling at the sky as he's running about without shoes on. It's cold outside. Charlotte's saying it's cold. He's yelling, talking about Venus and his angel. And the next thing you know, he has on absolutely no clothes as he's looking up to the sky, talking about Venus. And he's yelling up at Venus. And Charlotte is watching on as it all starts to make sense that something is not right with this man's mind. Reynolds comes out and tries to put the rope on the king. He's not having it. He's too busy trying to look for Venus. And she grabs the rope from Reynolds and she puts it gently over him to cover him up over his shoulders. And she tells him that Venus isn't there, that she is Venus and Venus is going back inside. He says, Venus is indoors. And he's like, you know, Venus is indoors. I thought Venus was in the sky. And she says, Venus is indoors and she's leading him back inside. And as they're going back inside, she says, Venus is with you. She is with you. And they head back into the house with Reynolds following behind them. And that is how they ended. And I said, what in the world has Charlotte gotten herself into? And my question to you all is when you saw this, what did you think? Because given what we know now and what we've seen, it's clear to me that there's some type of, I don't know if it's schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, there's some type of psychosis going on. And unfortunately, Charlotte is married to this king. Y'all let me know what you thought of this episode put it down in the comment section it was a little lengthy but i had to make sure that I, I i got certain points in if there's something that i left out that you want to discuss feel free to put it down below so we can discuss until next time